I'm Scott Schober. I am Chief Media Commentator for Cybersecurity Ventures, and I am here with Robert Hershevik. have the privilege, and he's well known, uh, not just Shark Tank, but certainly an entrepreneur, innovator, cybersecurity leader, and uh, I'm going to get a nice opportunity here to sit down and chat with you a little bit and get some of your thoughts. Thank you. And uh, I wanted to also start out by just congratulating you. Uh, Hershevik Group made the Cybersecurity 500 list as the number one, which is Certainly very impressive, so congratulations yeah, for thank that. thank you, Scott. It's been a long journey. We started out at 150 or something, but uh, I, I, it's an amazing time in our industry. And look at the growth of cybersecurity ventures. And I think the more information we can provide people, the stronger our community becomes. Yeah, absolutely. And we know cyber crimes are not going away anytime soon. They're getting worse as we're, we have IoT and we've got smart devices. We're all connecting to the internet. It's getting more and more challenging. We we'll get into some of these and get some of your take and some of your thoughts and see how we can keep ourselves safe. And uh, we get into some nice uh, statistics as well. So I look forward to hearing some of your thoughts there. Now, Cybersecurity Ventures calls cybercrime the greatest threat to every single company in the world. It's one of the biggest challenges facing humanity. What do you think of that? Do you agree on that, Robert? Yeah, I do agree with that. I think not only, I would expand it, not only is it the single greatest threat to every company, it's the single greatest threat to every nation. You know, you look at the last budget that the president uh, pushed through, even with Obama in the previous budget, there were only two factions of the military that got increased spending. It was special ops and cybersecurity. And the fundamental economics of cyber terrorism or cyber war or cyber crime are not going to change. And that is, it requires very little capital and resources to launch a wide scale attack of any kind. You know, to, to buy a tank or an airplane, not only does it require a lot of money, an F-15 is $180 million, uh, but it requires a lot of training. The average person can't walk into a cockpit and use that as a tool for terrorism. But you take two highly trained, idealistic young people, and they can become weapons of cyber terrorism pretty quickly. And so uh, I think it fundamentally poses one of the greatest risks to forward momentum. And the reason I say that is technology is such an incredible enabler to society. If we look at the ability of the things we can do today with our smartphones or cars or hotel rooms, all of that. It is the basis of humanity that technology will make things go faster, better, simpler. But if that stops, what happens to our society? And there are several things that can stop that. One is a critical hit to our infrastructure, a general scale war, but we've learned that it's really difficult to attack big companies or big countries with people or money, but Terrorism could stop the advent of technology. So on a larger scale, that's what I worry about. I worry that cybercrime doesn't become inconvenient mm. or uncomfortable. I worry that it becomes so pervasive, it stops the advent of technology. Yeah. <clears throat> Scary. Now, Cyber Security Ventures predicts that cybercrime will cost the world $6 trillion annually by 2021, staggering numbers when we think about That's it. six Amazons. Yeah, exactly. It's hard to even comprehend, it, 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 it's that large there. It represents the greatest transfer of economic wealth in history and will be more profitable than global trade of all major illegal drugs combined. What do you think, Robert? Is there that much monetary damage that really can be done by cyber? Yeah. It's it's staggering. I think that cybersecurity ventures is is dead on, mm -hmm. and I I actually think that the numbers might be conservative. Okay, you know I come across industries, for example, healthcare. Mm -hmm. You're talking about industries that have some level of cybersecurity knowledge and some level of infra infrastructure protection. Look at the hospital systems in the United States today. There are hospital systems that are so far behind, they have basic architecture with no security. You know, one of the things we always say is, if people don't have a sophisticated firewall, an application level firewall, 
or some level of EDR, advanced protection at the endpoint, or a SIM for logging, they're in the dark ages. I walk into hospitals every week that don't have any of those things. And they're protecting patient records. So if you take that statistic, you're measuring it financially, but you look at the cost, for example, of a patient record, what is the cost of that over a lifetime? And what is the cost to replace one? You steal my credit card, I can get a new Amex 48 hours. You steal my patient record, how long is that gonna take me? And then you take that to manufacturing and other industries, it, it's a big staggering number. Yeah. And you look at you look at medical fraud, you look at how they could profit from it versus a credit card bringing a couple dollars for a stolen credit card, get a patient ID, or different tests that they're taking, everything, you could really take that leverage and sell it for hundreds of dollars. What a, what yeah, a the average cost of a patient record is in the hundreds. The average cost on the black market of a verified patient record is still hundreds of dollars. The average cost of a credit card, I think, is now down to a buck or two it's bucks. Peanuts. Yeah, it's peanut. You know why? Because there's so many of them. <laughs> Supply and demand. Supply and demand. It's, it's, right? Exactly, yeah. Crazy, right? Well, in, in interesting, in 2018, we have more than 4 billion people online. In fact, Cybersecurity Ventures predicted that there will be 6 billion internet users by 2022. Amazing number, right? Now, there'll be more than 7.5 billion, billion internet users by 2030. So when we, we look at that and extrapolate it, that's a lot of people there. So thinking about how many people are online and that growth, are we prepared to protect cyber when you think about yeah. it? Yeah, there's, there's a uh, adjunct to that stat that Art Caviello, the former chairman of RSA said to me, uh, similar stats with the amount of people going online, there are currently something like eight or nine or seven billion IP addresses. Mm -hmm. So the IPV committee says by 2020, there'll be hundreds of billions, if not trillions of IP addresses. So not only are we adding people, mm -hmm. each person is multiplying the amount of IP addresses they're adding to the internet. So you look at, you look at me, I've got two phones, mm -hmm. two iPads, my TV, my, my baby's room has four IP addresses. <laughs> like, it's staggering to me. So the camera has an IP, like, think of all those connected devices. So we are mushrooming the amount of IP yeah. addresses and expanding. So I think the bigger stat is not just so much the people that are going online, it's what they're doing online. If all those people are going online with an old compact computer, I, I think we'd be okay. So I think it's the amount of IP addresses. And the other big stat is the intensity of access. The modern user's expectation of access is immediacy. Immediacy. I, I got here late last night and I was on the hotel Wi-Fi and it was 2.30 in the morning. I was tired, I couldn't go to sleep. So I went outside the hotel room, I had a cigar, shouldn't smoke. Um, and I'm trying to watch Netflix. Mm -hmm. I'm streaming Netflix on my iPad, trying to you know wind down, and it's not like going bang. Not instant. Yeah. yeah. And I'm getting frustrated. I'm like, oh, stupid internet Wi-Fi. What? And then I realize, think how phenomenal that is. I'm streaming a show, and when they started Netflix, there was no streaming. They created a product on which they felt the technology would catch up to it. And so I think it's that level of immediacy that is really concerning. And what's happening at the enterprise level, to your point about manufacturing and other businesses, you cannot stop progress. Mm -hmm. So CISOs know security is important. CISOs know, and now CIOs and COs also know, we have to be secure because we can actually lose our business. Having a bad cybersecurity strategy is not about getting hit or having a cyber breach, it's about losing your business. 
But then you have your users and consumers who want it now. Consumers are like three-year-old children. They don't understand no, and they shouldn't. Because if you want to compete with a competitor, you got to go and you got to make it faster. I think to your point there, you look where we are, look with 4G technology, LTE, it's fast in comparison to where we are. 5G is promising 100 times more speed, data, throughput, tie in with all the IoT devices, the Internet of Things, we want to be connected. Somebody just asked me, what's the difference between 5G and 4G? I said, it's faster. 100 (laughs) times faster. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. But here's the amazing thing is, three years from now, will we think 5G is fast? No. Three years from now, will we think that an endpoint attack or stolen patient records like we've seen were a big deal? Remember when Target happened and some of those big breaches, Mm -hmm. we thought, oh my gosh, this is so horrific. I, I think it's the tip of the iceberg. And sadly, I, I don't think, I think consumers care, but there isn't that connection with it yet. And frankly, I don't think governments pay att- enough attention to it. And I, and I hate to say it, and I hate to be pessimistic and be Dr. Doom on it, but I think that we're gonna go through a period where some level of breach will affect human life. Mm-hmm. and. There's a line that gets crossed when something like that happens. And I just think that the infrastructure in this country, we, we've got to go faster to protect it. I think there's a, a cyber complacency almost where people are saying credit card, this or that. But when it hits critical infrastructure, when it hits lives, right. as you mentioned, game changer. I had, a, react. I had a, a meeting at the Department of Homeland Security uh, a couple of years ago. And we're talking about a big cyber scenario and breach. And there's a general there. And he said, you know, that this is all very interesting, but let me tell you the difference between what you do and what I do. When bad things happen in my world, people die. And, I, and that really hit me. And I walked out of that room thinking, yeah, he's right. That's so much more critical. And then I thought, hang on a second. What we do is that level of critical. Because some of those infrastructure points, some of those hospitals, Some of those patient records are that critical. And I think that's what cybercrime has become. It's just become crime. Cyber terrorism, I think, has just stopped being cyber terrorism. It's just terrorism now. Yeah, scary stuff. Well, we hear a lot about biometrics, facial recognition, new digital error that'll replace the logins, the passwords that we all can't stand, trying to remember all these things. Despite promises of the future where there'll be no more passwords, we keep hear about it, hearing about yeah. that, <laughs> which may come, may not, we don't know. A uh, 2017 report found that the world will need to protect about 300 billion passwords globally by 2020. So the question is, how important is it to stay grounded in reality of what we need to do in the world of cyber to stay protected today? Can we protect this? Yeah, it's interesting because you look at the password protection issue, there's a recent breach, as you know, around the, I uh, forget the, the company, but it was the electronic dual factor. Dual somebody factor had, authentication. Somebody had hacked into it. So you, you can't beat a physical component to electronic. And I think biometrics, I think fingerprint scans, I think there's, there's even some new products that look at the, how hard you hit the key mm-hmm. and your level of control. And I think that's all really great and becoming advanced, but it really comes down to identity. So I don't think we're going to fix the password issue anytime soon, but I think what we are going to grow is the identity of who we are. Mm. It's one of the reasons IAM and identity and privilege access are one of the fastest growing segments of cybersecurity, because if the perimeter is gone and I don't know where you're logging in from, and you want to log in from everywhere. Is the access instant? Yeah, how, how do I protect that device? And so, what I think we're going to see is a real shift to you become the endpoint. Mm. The human becomes the endpoint, and how do I secure that human? And I think a lot of that is around identity. And identity in our space is a lot of legacy software, you know, the big, Oracle CA type of stuff, which is bulky, powerful, but 
difficult to cumbersome to implement. Yeah, cumbersome to implement. And you have all those new players, the sailboats, the mm-hmm. cyber arcs, those kind of tools. So I, th- I think we're going to see tremendous growth in that area. But I do think that the we'll go through a phase where the passwords become less important and it'll become identity. You know what I want to do? I want to log on and not have a password. I, I just want stuff to know it's me. It's truly you and yeah. automatically authenticate, not have to worry about remembering and proving that you are who you are. But I think once the systems figure that out, somebody will figure out a way to breach it. That's true. Yeah. There's always a way around that. That's true. Nothing's 100% secure. Nothing. Yeah. Um, there's hundreds of thousands and possibly millions of people that can be hacked now, wirelessly connected, digital implants. We think about, we're talking about healthcare. Think about some of these things, uh, cardioverter, defibrillators, pacemakers, neurostimulators, insulin pumps, ear tubes, so on and so forth. Is cyber moving to a place where maybe we're going to see people will have to make a decision, life or death, I'm talking about ransomware, where you could be held ransom because maybe a medical implant and the hackers got you on the line there. Yeah, I think, you know, you're looking at brute force attacks or sequel injection. So if, if, you, if you think of a typical application from the beginning to the end. There's an amazing stat I read that the average enterprise has something like 200 legacy applications, Mm -hmm. meaning they've been around for more than 10 years. And they're built on code, which has been built on other code, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, so you have this incredible streamline effect of lots of access points that can be breached along the way. So is that ever going to go away? No. Is it going to get to a point where I could hold you ransom for that? Uh, Yeah, absolutely. We see this all the time. Small hospitals in this country are paying ransomware because they can't afford to fix the cyber breach. And today you'll pay it when it's convenient. So, you know, I'll pay a little bit of money to get back online because my doctors are yelling and stuff. The question becomes, to your question, if I'm holding a heart monitor ransom and the end result is life or death, will you still just pay? Mm -hmm. And what if one of those things go wrong? And so there's a massive amount of investment that hospitals, manufacturers, legacy systems, airlines, pipelines have to do to put themselves in a position in order to be able to make that choice. Many of the legacy systems can't make that choice today. They have to pay. Yeah, yeah they have no choice, you're right. They have no choice. Especially and look at the growth. Death. Yeah, and look at the growth Sorry. of Bitcoin. Yeah. Now you have unanimous or anonymous ways to pay, so the problem gets even worse. Yeah, it's compound. Wow. Now, Cybersecurity Ventures predicts global spending on cybersecurity products and services. They're going to exceed one trillion cumulatively from 2017 to 2000 or, or 2021. So taken as a whole, they anticipate 12 to 15 percent year-over-year cybersecurity growth through 2021. So are companies spending enough, or nearly just enough on cybersecurity? What, what's your thoughts on? It? Well, of course, I'm always going to say they're biased. not spending enough, <laughs> right? They should spend way more, and with us. Um, well said. I, I actually think that the stat is conservative and and I'll tell you why, just from personal experience, because, and I think Cybersecurity Ventures does a great job of putting that together. But I think what the outlier of that is, you have traditional security companies that aren't growing at that rate. Yes. So they're going kind of the other way. And I think when you bundle all of it, but you look at some of the niche players, you know, they're growing by 30, 40, 50%. You know, in our world, if you're not growing by 20% per year, you're not considered high growth. You're doing something wrong. Yeah. So there's a general rule of thumb in the cybersecurity industry that if your growth rate isn't 20%, you're not considered high growth. I mean, what other industry would that be true in? You know, you've got massive companies. So I I think people are, I don't think people are spending enough on a continuous basis. I still think that, that one of the challenges in our world is people buy spot solutions and don't implement them. Yeah. I think one of the big challenges is that people buy tools, 
but don't know how to use them. So people are buying lots of airplanes, but teaching nobody to fly. That is the bigger issue. It's how do you find highly educated people in order to be able to use those tools? You can buy all the guns you want, but eventually you have to teach people how to use them. And look what's happening in our industry with the lack of skill and the lack of shortage. So you have these big enterprises of lots of people in security. How do they train them? How do they keep them? And then how do they find new people? I know how hard it is for us. I can't imagine for other companies. Yeah, it's tough and there's no silver bullet for any of this either. It just takes time, it takes resources. Hey, we we're talking briefly about ransomware, just to, to, to circle back to that again. That's one of the fastest growing threats and I think it touches all of us. One way or another, we heard of somebody, or they're, they're small business or mm -hmm. enterprise level getting, getting affected there. Cybersecurity Ventures predicts that it will rise to every 14 seconds by 2019, up from every 40 seconds back in 2016. So when we look at that, it's almost wow. logarithmic growth. It's dramatic growth. What are your thoughts, where we are now, where we're going with, with ransomware? It, there's all kinds of stats I used to have about ransomware. The level of growth is unbelievable. And now what's happening is it's moving away from sophisticated systems to you know the tertiary yeah. hospitals, manufacturing, other ones. And even consumers still want the easiest forms of, of crime. And the most easily accessible way for ransomware is still phishing. Yeah, it works. It works. It works. Uh, you know, we always try to say to our customers, you're really not that sexy. <laughs> there isn't a woman in Russia that wants to meet you. Mm -hmm. And you didn't win a million dollars from a contest you never entered. But people still do it. They still click on it and they still get caught. So what you're saying is really use common sense. Don't be gullible. Don't be so quick to click. Think right. twice. And, and people still are not doing it. And that's why it's so successful. Well, common sense isn't that common. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I think it's hard though, because as we get more automated and most of our communication becomes electronic, it, it's hard. You get in a cadence email, 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 text, text, text. Something pops up, sure. you know, you're, you're tempted. Especially Easy to if say. It's convincing. If it yes. looks a little convincing. And it looks so real these days. It does, yeah. yeah, you can get automated kits on the dark web. You can be in business in no time for a couple hundred dollars. You can be a professional fisher if you want. Right. It, it's scary. Yeah. Now, the demand for cybersecurity professionals will increase to approximately 6 million globally by 2019, wow. according to some industry experts. That was cited by Palo Alto Research uh, Center there. Cybercrime will more than triple the number of job openings to 3.5 million unfilled positions by 2021. And cybersecurity unemployment rate will remain at 0%. So yeah, yeah if, what do you I, think about that? I always say to people, if you're in cybersecurity and you don't have a job, it's you. Yeah, you got <laughs> it's problem. not the industry. It's definitely you. Um, I don't think we're going to see that change. And how do people keep up with that? We have to bring people into our industry that may not be in it today. And we have to find a way to attract people that aren't traditionally attracted to computers. Not just a computer geek per se, yeah. really pulling so, them from other, other avenues. Um, women. Uh, different minorities. I think that the lack of immigration becomes challenging because it, it helps that a lot of people from overseas want to do uh, computer oriented jobs. I think it's going to continue to be harder. We have to continue to train, we have to continue to try to hire, but it's not a problem that's going away. I definitely believe that stat. Now, uh, Steve Morgan, founder and editor in chief of Cybersecurity Ventures, he's been quoted saying, every IT position is also a cybersecurity position now. So right. every IT worker, every technology worker needs to be involved with protecting, defending apps, protecting data, devices, infrastructure, people. Do, do you agree with that? His sentiment it's a great there? quote. It's a great quote. Fabulous. I fully believe that. I was at a meeting the other day and this company was telling us about their cybersecurity strategy and where they were going. And I said to them, along Steve's point, I said, as long as you have the following in your company, 
you will be insecure. And I said, what is that? I said, human beings. Yeah. As long as you have humans, there'll be a level of insecurity around it. And it's not a single person's job to fix that. It's everybody from the IT person to the networking person. And you look at that's happening today. I remember when firewalls first came out and the, the people who looked at for firewalls were cyber security people. Today, many companies look at firewalls and say, it's a network device. It's critical, but, or, but not. yeah, it's a network infrastructure. And so now security has gone out of the C-suite of CISO, but it's also part of the infrastructure. It's part of the endpoint. It's part of applications. If you're building applications that aren't secure, you, you can't secure the overall environment. So it's not just one person. We're seeing the role of the CISO change more into a somebody who sets policy mm. and direction as opposed to necessarily controlling the tools. And in larger enterprises, you have to secure the environment with people that don't work for you. And that becomes challenging. Now, building on that point there, you, your company spends a lot of time with CEOs, C-suite executives, on cybercrime, on, on cybersecurity in general. If you had to give one piece of advice maybe to a, to a CEO, what would it be? Whew, that's a great question. Um, understand what today looks like. There are too many people that aren't aware of their current infrastructure. You know, they have a false sense of either uh, pain or they have a false sense of how strong their environment is. And the biggest thing you can do is have a very clear grasp of what the environment is today. People are spending more on cybersecurity. It's getting easier to get budgets. But I always say to people, it's not unlimited. Yeah. So if you spend a few million dollars on the wrong thing, don't assume you'll get a few more million dollars. You still need to provide a return. And I think that's the biggest gap that we see is people aren't clear as to what the state of their security is. Know where the holes are. Excellent. Certainly some good advice. Well, thank you very yeah, much. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time, Robert. And uh, thank you. wish you and Hershevik Group much success as you continue on keeping us all safe. Thank you. Thank you.